Namaste. So let's talk about chapters 8 and 9 of the Satikanda, of the Rudra Samhita, of Shiva Purana. <laughs> these are great. I mean, I laughed so many times while reading these and studying them. Because just see how Shiva sets up Brahma. I mean, he totally controls Brahma, knowing exactly how he's going to react, and really makes Brahma totally his tool. <laughs> and in that way, by using Brahma, he sets up the whole universe to be in Maya. Uh, just think about it. I mean, you did watch these episodes, right? Or hear them? <laughs> because I'm going to be referring to things outside the context of this talk. And if you haven't heard those episodes, you won't know what I'm talking about. That doesn't seem to deter anybody anyway. Uh, but that's what really you should do. So anyway, poor Brahma. He's in the mode of passion through and through. He has such a big ego, huh? but also a delicate one. So because he was criticized by Shiva for falling in love with his own daughter, he became malicious. And he said, I'm going to get that Shiva. I'm going to make him fall down to, into lust and take a wife. Because he knew that the hallmark of Shiva is his yogic perfection, that he can't be moved. So he got uh, Rati and Kama and Vasanta, spring, all three of them. Uh, Rati means lust. And Kama, of course, means sex desire, specifically. And Vasanta means spring. So he got them to go and try to delude Shiva. And they were completely unsuccessful. They could not move him in the least. But in the process, they enthralled everybody else. So this is how the living beings came to be deluded by lust that uh, Brahma, in his <laughs> uh, efforts to get revenge on Shiva for insulting him, actually covered the whole world with this illusion that we're going to enjoy through lust. We're going to enjoy through sex. Now, you know, my mother was a tantrika, and she taught me tantric sex uh, procedures, methods, through giving me books from when I was, you know, a young boy, 12, 13 years old. As soon as, as, soon as she detected that I was interested in sex, basically, she started to educate me. So, you know, I know a little bit about sex. <laughs> in fact, I know a lot about it. There is a way that you can approach sex such that it becomes a part of your spiritual life. And that is what I have done my whole life. And it has served me very, very well. However, I was not able to find anyone who could understand this. People in the West, especially, and even in India, take Tantra, or their, their uh, rather creative understanding of Tantra, 
to be a license for unrestricted sex life. And it is anything but. It's a discipline, a very difficult discipline. Because the body is always saying, come on, let's indulge, let's indulge. And you, you have to hold it back, you know, like reining in a wild horse. So the people who don't know this, who don't know the Vajroli Mudra, which means ex experiencing sex life but retaining the semen, those who don't know this practice or do it suffer from depletion. And who are the uh, troops that Brahma created to help uh, Rati and Kama and, and uh, Vasanta? The Maras, death. Because simply uh, passing semen without any yogic disciplines around it leads to premature death. I've, I've always wanted to do a series on sex economics, which is a term invented by the uh, German psychiatrist Wilhelm Reich. Uh, but you know, I don't think people are ready for it. I, I think people would take it in the wrong way. So I've, I've held back. I haven't given this knowledge. But I would give it to anyone who actually becomes a disciple, of course, because it gives them tremendous mental and physical strength. But anyway, the vast majority, overwhelming majority of living beings don't practice any kind of discipline in regards to sex. They indulge in it whenever they can, however they can, and as much as they can. And as a result, their minds and bodies become weak. They become subject to diseases, both mental and physical. So we see uh, in our efforts to educate people on this channel how people are so lazy. They're so weak-minded. We're telling people, go to the original scriptures. Don't take anyone's word for it, including mine. But go to the original scriptures and research these things on your own. Learn Sanskrit. Use the dictionary. Define all the terms. Get everything completely clear. But they don't do it. Here we're giving them the keys uh, to happiness, health, wealth, power if they want it, really self-realization, the whole universe. Huh? But they don't take it up. You know, can you imagine uh, a person going to a feast and they get presented with this big tray full of the most delicious edibles and encrusted with valuable jewels and gold. And they say, Oh, no thanks, I'm fasting. <laughs> Can you imagine? It's so contrary to common sense that it's hard to even think of it. How it would be possible? Who could act like that? Huh? But with regard to spiritual knowledge, people are illusioned. This is the result of Kama's work trying to seduce Shiva. And we'll see. It's because of Brahma's envious nature that he uh, really cursed all the living entities in the universe by uh, setting Kama loose on them while trying to uh, divert Shiva from his yogic practices. It's simply because Brahma, being conditioned by the mode of passion, considered Rudra his son. Rudra was born from Brahma's third eye. 
when he became angry at the four Kumaras because they would not become Prajapatis. They would not uh, take up wives and produce offspring for the population of the universe. And Brahma became so angry. And, you know, because he's the creator, he's empowered that whatever he thinks on with intensity manifests. Actually, that's true for all of us, but especially for Brahma. So Rudra was born from his anger. And Rudra, of course, destroys the universe at the end of the creation. Rudra also punishes the living entities who deviate from the Vedic truths. So Rudra is like anger personified. He conducts the mode of tamoguna, which some people translate as ignorance, but it's not only ignorance, it's also anger, destructiveness, and like that. So we see in the material world, many, many people affected by these modes of passion and ignorance, and very, very few people who manifest a mode of goodness, just doing what they're doing as a duty without any thought of reaping profits or advantage or any other kind of results from it, except maybe self-realization. See, like we're doing these videos, we're not charging. It's not like you could come to, uh, you know, a temple or an ashram and pay money and stay as a guest. And uh, then I can, you know, bewilder your mind with various talks and stuff. Uh, that's an old scam. And so many people fall for it. Why? Because it's easy. They are fundamentally cheaters. Just like I was talking about before, the people on this channel get all the keys to the knowledge, but they don't use them. Why? It's hard work. It takes a long time. You have to do all these practices without any real guarantee of success because the success is given by higher authorities. It's not something we can do, but it is something we can prepare ourselves for. And that's what the practices are for. So anyway, people don't want to do this. So if they have a way of just throwing money at the problem and making the responsibility somebody else, they'll do it. So there are all these cheating gurus who come up saying, just come to my ashram and pay for my luxury accommodations and our expensive seminars and our special darshans. And you will get, I will make sure you get enlightenment. <laughs> Anybody who falls for that is a loser. Has to be, because nobody but you can take responsibility for your spiritual life. I mean, who cares? Huh? Only someone with supreme compassion is going to care for your actual benefit. And even then, they also have their own benefit in mind. Because acting in the mode of goodness for the benefit of others is the supreme spiritual service, which gives the greatest result which is complete detachment from material life and full enlightenment. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.